Is it sugar? Yeah, it says that. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so this is kind of like a more in like informal talk in the sense of I'm kind of presenting papers that don't really have um, like theoretical results or like good explanations. They're more empirical papers that have kind of interesting observations um, on like deep generative models. So like you can interrupt and um, I encourage that uh, if you have questions and stuff. Um, like I, I can also talk about my own like speculation for like the behavior, but um, you know, you can also like jump in with your own thoughts on um, what we're going through. So like to start off, um, there's this interesting observation from some recent um, diffusion model generative um, like diffusion generative model papers um, that have been using the CIFAR 10 data set to like showcase their model. Um, so th these are two cars from the CIFAR 10 data set. Um, and we're going to look at some unconditional samples from published generative models in 2020, like the, the two most like well cited diffusion model papers. Um, if you look at this one from Ho, um, like DDPM, you can see like there is exact reproductions of the CIFAR 10 data set in the, the unconditional samples, um, which is a bit concerning since, I mean, the whole point of um, having this generative model is to create somehow novel samples. So, I mean, we're seeing here that it's basically memorizing the CIFAR 10 data set. And again, in the song paper, like stochastic differential equation, <clears throat> in the class conditional samples, you have the exact same cars appearing again um, in that data set. So like, I, I didn't notice this myself. It's from another paper that is looking at memorization in deep generative models. Um, and they were looking at the CIFAR 10 data set and they found that these two cars appear like many times in the training data set. So, I mean, the model is in, like, they, they appear like there's duplications of that car in the data set. So obviously the model is learning to kind of like reproduce that exactly, which is why you're kind of getting this um, exact copying from the data set in your synthetic samples, uh, which, which isn't mentioned at all in the, in the original papers. Um, so actually, like, I was looking through yesterday, the CIFAR 10 data set and the published um, synthetic samples from DDPM, the Ho paper, because um, they published like 50,000 generated samples from their model. And like, we wanted to see like, um, is like how many duplications of the training data set are there in its generated samples? Um, so like, on the top left, that is a generated sample, like a published generated sample from that model. And then on the bottom right is like nearest neighbors in CIFAR 10. I mean, and from this, you can see that that car is literally in this data set like over 20 times. So it's, I mean, it's not surprising that it does generate that exa <clears throat> like exactly. Um, and then, I mean, the, the model they're using in this paper has like 36 million parameters um, and CIFAR 10 is only 50,000 images. So it's not that surprising that it's kind of reproducing this example exactly. Um, but I wanted to know like, is this unique to um, this car or like, is it, a, is it like a common problem? Um, and I had a look through a lot of generated images like this frog. Um, the top left is the generated sample, and then the bottom right block is the CIFAR 10 um, training data set from nearest neighbors. And you can kind of see that I, I couldn't find any more duplications. Like, so, so the FID scores of these models is like very good. So, and that would be explained if they were just duplicating the training data set because FID doesn't incorporate 
any penalization of memorization. So it's like, okay, is the reason diffusion models having great FAD because they're just duplicating the data set? And seeing that car is a bit worrying, um, but I don't actually think they're duplicating the data set. Um, like having a look through the rest of the samples. So in the paper of OpenAI, like the diffusion model began, they have a whole thing where they just actually look at that as well, mm -hmm. or whether it memorizes the data set or they have like, they found it was for the model and they knew that it wasn't that. Uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's like, I, I find it like super surprising that like that frog looks very good. Like the generator sample looks very good and it's been trained on 50,000 images, which is like, why, why does it work so well? Like yeah, yeah. Th this is, this is the, <laughs> the strange behavior uh, part of this. Like the fact it works well, I think is strange. Yeah. Um, I mean, and I'm, the rest of the presentation is going through other like strange things. Um, mostly about why it's working well um yeah because i mean it's like a very high dimensional space you have fifty thousand training data examples yet somehow you're interpolating between them in a very reasonable like human identifiable way um yeah this is going through some other like examples where it works well this is the open air paper from uh the end of 2021 where they have text conditional image generation trained with like a 3 billion parameter model on 250 million image text pairs. Um, and you can get like results like that where you, you clearly are not duplicating the data because these are completely novel samples. Um, and like, I think it's like very surprising in general that like a generative model can produce something like that. Like, like what bias are we imparting such that you can give it, you know, a, a, a sparse covering of a, of a data distribution and have it um, interpolate in such like a meaningful way? I think is very surprising to me. Um, yeah, just like a bit more notation uh, as we go into like a different paper. Um, you can formalize the problem as having some, some input space X uh, data set uh, of N examples drawn from some underlying data distribution in that space. Um, we then have some like algorithm A, which is our like um, our optimization procedure and our model, so like a GAN or a BAE or a diffusion model. Um, and this somehow produces a like distribution Q, we usually like samples from Q that is somehow close to your data distribution. Um, and this is like a fundamentally difficult problem because one, like your unbiased density estimation is impossible. And not only that, <laughs> your data set size is usually like going to be exponentially small compared to the um, support of the data set. Like, your covering of your data, of your um, data distribution is going to be like very sparse. So we're going to need like some assumptions or some like inductive biases that um, we can use to produce like a reasonable approximate distribution Q that is like somehow close to P, like to the data distribution in a, like, a reasonable way. Um, and I think the question is what inductive biases do these models have? Um, I mean, obviously they have good inductive biases, like as we've seen before, but like what are the inductive biases and where are they coming from? I think it's not very well known. Um, so this is like one of the first, like a first paper to look at. It's by Ermon in 2016. And I think it's quite an interesting empirical paper. So they are, studying like the input output behavior of a deep generation model as like a whole black box algorithm by probing it with um, make, like specially designed data sets. Um, and then they're gonna investigate like how close this approximate distribution Q is to the data distribution through some low dimensional feature projection um, of high dimension images. So that the data sets are all images, but they're going to compare the closeness of Q and P data with some like low dimensional feature projection, which um, when I say low dimensional projection, it's more 
um, you're going to have like a data set of um, circles, like five circles, and then the generated data will have a certain number of circles as well. And then the low dimensional projection is just how many circles in the image, and then you can compare the distribution. Um, and they use like a variety of both neural net architectures and models, and they find in general that their results are holding across like model and architecture so that it's suggesting the behavior they observe is some kind of inductive bias common to all of them, um, which is, I guess, narrows down what it could. <laughs> so yeah, the, the first like empirical study they did on is like this single mode generalization. So like on the left, you have examples, um, you have this like synthetic data set that they've created. Um, on the top row, you have, as I was saying, this like data set of, of colored dots. So you, in the training data set, you have thousands of images of colored dots, but they all have six dots in them and the different colors. And then you train them all on that and you have it produce new samples. And then you count how many dots in the, producer, in the produced images. And then you get sometimes six, but also like eight dots or seven dots. Um, which is a very like, reasonable generalization. Like it's completely out of the data distribution um, like support because you know, if you're actually realistically reproducing the data distribution, you should only have have six dots, but to have eight is a very reasonable generalization. So it seems that, well, one, it's generalizing from this like single mode of six dots, but it's generalizing in a very reasonable way. And in that, we wouldn't say this is like erroneous, it's kind of, um, it's kind of generalization, generalization you want. Um, and it's, it's strange how we didn't really have to impart a specific inductive bias to induce this like generalization that is useful. Um, and then it's a similar story with this uh, data set of 3D uh, objects. You, you have a training data set, we only have, have two objects in your images. And then when you um, produce new samples, you can get one object or three objects which again is like a very um, strangely useful generalization that we didn't really expect to happen or encourage explicitly. <clears throat> this is like a graph uh, of that previous um, uh, example where on the x-axis you have the number of dots in your training data set. So like your, your entire data set is images of 10 dots or your entire data set is images of 11 dots. And then, um, that like spread is um, the distribution of like frequency of dots in the synthetic uh, generated samples. So when you have like a low number of um, dots in your training data set, your generated samples will also be quite peaked on that kind of specific number because it's I guess the model it's, it's easier to 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 realize that I need to produce a specific number. But when you have high number of dots, it seems that it's more spread out, um, and then it the model finds it more difficult to produce that specific number and also generalizes to a wider number. Um, so there's some kind of rule where the number of kind of comp like number of features in your data set, somehow um, the more features you have, the more complexity you have in the data set, the greater the amount of like generalization or spread you're getting in um, your synthetic samples. Um, this is a different experiment that they did where um, the training data set consists of colored pie charts uh, and uh, always a certain proportion of the pie chart is the color red. So say like 20% is always red or 50% is always red. And then it will generate new pie charts. And then your, your, your like low dimensional feature projection is like what proportion of that pie chart is red. And it's a similar similar story where when you have say like a low proportion of reds, like ten percent, then you have quite a peaked um, distribution of red in your synthetic samples. So um, if you yeah if you say like ten percent you, you you get between like eight percent and thirteen percent red in your synthetic samples. But if you were to train on only pie charts that have fifty percent red, then you have quite a large spread in your synthetic samples. So there's some kind of Again, like uh, this is this is more kind of like relative changes, like a, a change from 
10% to 12% is more significant to the model, it seems, than a change from like 50% to 52%. It seems like relative changes um, in this like amount of red is more important um, to the model because you know it, it's easier to like, it's, it seems that the model is like the synthetic distribution is more peaked around small amounts of red. So it's like, um, I, I don't know, it's, uh, it seems to be, um, yeah, it's like it's it's like knows that it's important to have a low number, and then um, it's spread when it um, generates synthetic samples. It's going to be like more peaked when it's kind of like very specific that it needs a, a low proportion. Which again is like a interesting bias there. Um, so then. These previous experiments were looking at examples where you had a specific number of, of a feature in your training data set. And then they looked at this like spread out when you um, generated samples. So then they asked the question of like, if you have a data set with like two modes, so in your pie chart, you either have 30% red or 90%, then what is your distribution in your synthetic samples then? Um, so in the, in the kind of bottom row, you have that. 30%, 90% example. And this like predicted by convolution part is basically taking the response to a 30% data set and taking the response to a 90% and just like putting them together. And then they show that that predicts the actual distribution of the synthetic samples quite well. But if you were to have a training distribution where you have 30% red plus 40% red, then the predicted by convolution, where you just um, put together those two impulse responses, has a little bit of a dip in the middle, but the actual learned distribution is um, actually greater between the two modes. So there's some kind of um, there's some kind of effect here where when you have two modes close together, they have they kind of like reinforce each other, and actually in your synthetic distribution a proportion of red that it's never seen before in the data set is actually more likely than anything it's seen in the data set, um, which seems to be some kind of useful interpolation happening where um, when data points that the model considers to be close together, like points in the middle, also quite likely um, and more likely than would be predicted by just kind of checking the impulse response at each individual mode. Yeah. This one? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not quite sure exactly. It's, it seems quite unimodal, like definitely more unimodal than this one. But I don't know if it's because of like the discretization they have on this graph, because it is quite a coarse one. It could be a bit. There could be a bit of detail loss there. That's true. Um, and then, yeah, the final experiment to talk about in this paper is this one on um, three MNIST digits. So the data set consists of images of three MNIST digits. So you have a possible thousand types of image you could have there. Um, modulo, like the rearranging within the image. Um, and what they do here is they pick a subset of that 1000, so like 10 possible um, three digit combinations, and then repeat those in different um, arrangements for the entirety of the training data set. And then they look at what combinations <coughs> appear in the um, synthetic and generated distribution, and then they compare using like this recall and precision metric. So recall proportion of combinations in the support of the data distribution that are also in the support of the synthetic distribution. So recall is the kind of like amount of memorization. It's like, um, are all of the combinations in the data distribution also present in the synthetic distribution? And from the graph, you see that basically it doesn't, as you increase the number of combinations, it's always able to like reproduce those combinations and it can remember what combinations it's seen in the distribution and then reliably produce them again. Um, but precision is 
proportional combinations in the support of the synthetic data distribution that are also in the support of the true data distribution. So you can see that precision is going down as you increase the number of combinations, which is meaning that there is um, more and more combinations in the synthetic distribution that do not appear in the data distribution. So as you, you're increasing the number of combinations in the data distribution, you're getting like more and more generalization in some sense, like more and more novel combinations appearing in your synthetic distribution. Um, again, this somehow this like vague idea of number of features or number of things in your data distribution as you increase that your model kind of loses the capacity to explicitly memorize specific combinations of things and starts to produce novel um, combinations of like features in some hand wavy sense. Um, yeah, and then I guess you can see here it's, it's kind of consistent across uh, like two very different types of generative model, like the GAN and the VAE, um, and also um, uh, like between convolution art architectures and um, multi-layer perceptrons, you get very similar behavior. So um, whatever's causing this kind of behavior is, is common to all of those models. Um, so this is like a, a, a follow-up paper to that. It, it, it's by different authors, but um, it seems to be one of the few papers that cite that paper that actually kind of continues this empirical study and maybe tries to explain it a little bit. Um, so they're, they're specifically focusing on the GAN section of that. Um, so just like quickly going over the um, GAN objective, you have a discriminator D that is trained to predict the probability that a given image, say, um, is from the data distribution. So it gives an output from zero to one, zero being it believes it's a fake example and one being it believes it's from the data distribution and then you train that jointly with a generator g which takes a like latent variable sampled from some like simple distribution like a isotropic gaussian p of z and generates um, an image that should be somehow like images it's seen in the data distribution um, and then you train them with this like minimax objective where the discriminator is trained to separate um, images generated by the generator and real ones, and the generator is trained to try and maximize the probability that the discriminator is, is assigning to its generated images. So you can kind of see that the discriminator uh, is the one that is like the guiding signal for the generator. So if you can say things about the discriminator, then you can kind of like imply things about the discriminator, which is what they're going to do in the later bit. Okay. So their, their first uh, experiment that they do to try and explain this behavior is comparing like mini batch gradient descent and batch gradient descent. And their argument here is that perhaps the noise introduced by mini batch gradient descent is somehow responsible for um, this kind of single mode generalization. So in this experiment, they have a data set that only ever has two squares in it. And then they generate samples from your generator. And when they train with minimax gradient descent, they sometimes get images with one square or three squares, which is very similar behavior that we've seen before. Um, but when you train with full batch gradient descent, it seems that you only ever get two squares. So it's, it's in, implying that this behavior has maybe something to do with um, like the stochasticity in your, in your gradient descent, um, which I guess like they don't really provide any like proof or um, mm -hmm. the proof they provide, I feel is a bit um, not really relevant. Um, but I think it's uh, an interesting like first idea about where this behavior might be coming from. Um, because it, when you're training the discriminator, say on like a noisy signal or on, only on a few um, examples, it, Perhaps it has to look for somehow like shortcut features um, to tell between generated and real data points. So in this like square example, um, perhaps it looks for um, 90 degree angles or something like that. And if it's only ever looking for 90 degree angles, then that 
um, allows the generator to generate three squares and still have the discriminator believe it is a real image. But say when it's trained on full batch gradient descent, um, maybe the discriminator somehow learns to actually look for two squares. So then the, the generator won't ever generate not two squares. But yeah, I think maybe the takeaway is like, it doesn't really provide an explanation, but some kind of um, hint as to perhaps it has something to do with the stochasticity and the interest. Um, this is, it's an interesting behavior of GANs, but it's not really explaining anything we've seen before in the previous paper. Um, but what they've noticed is that GANs can sometimes produce um, exact pixel-wise averages of training data images. So um, on the left, you can see like images that a GAN has generated that look a bit like um, two faces kind of like average together and you can you can actually find um, training data points in the data set that if you take some kind of complex combination of them you will get a image that looks very, very close to what the um, and has generated so um, for, for one it's showing that the model is memorizing training data points and two it's showing that um, with this specific model there's some kind of um, there's something going on that's allowing um, convex combinations to appear as real um, to the discriminator. Because if the discriminator believes these images are real, then the generator can, can learn to generate them. And this is something that they can actually like prove something about. But it's kind of like it follows straight away from if you assume your discriminator is um, Lipschitz um, and you assume that it is producing accurate uh, classifications on the training data set, then it kind of like directly follows that you can have um, convex combinations of training data points that are um, classified as real. They also mean that no. Classified as real okay. by the discriminator. Um, so yeah, like going through what they do is you, you have your discriminator that you assume is L Lipschitz and you assume, so discriminator zero for believing it's synthetic example and one for believing it's a real example. You assume that it's greater than a half plus epsilon, some epsilon greater than zero for all the like training data points. So you're assuming that it's giving like um, good classifications for all the training data points. And then you, um, you take two, uh, say so images from the data set that are close, um, like within some delta of each other. And then you look at the difference that the, of the value that the discriminator assigns to the convex combination of them versus the value the discriminator assigns to um, one of them. And then like use your Lipschitz assumption and then use your assumption that they are close with delta. And then you do the same thing for the discriminator value on the other data point and then get this inequality. And then from the, those two inequalities, you can get that as long as your epsilon, which is the amount that the discriminator is correct on the train data set, as long as your epsilon is greater than this value here, then you have that the discriminator is assigning a probability greater than half for any convex combination of the two data points. So you're showing that like, if you have some kind of like smoothness assumption and discriminator, then it's possible to um, believe that convex combinations are also real and therefore the generator could learn to generate those. I'm not so sure it, because it for Gann, I think the, the Lipschitz constant can be crazy. You know? <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I, don't know that, yes. really was, I just put it in. Yeah, it's just what I said. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the final paper that I had to talk about is like, is the paper that had the CFR 10 examples. Um, and it's looking at this idea of like memorization in deep generative models. Um, like kind of quoting from the paper because it's not 
looking at the kind of memorization that we were talking about before. It's, it's looking at um, the kind of memorization that is occurring by having data points that affect the assigned probability density of your synthetic distribution, like Q of X. It's looking at data points that affect that distribution a lot. So um, this is the kind of um, way they're placing their work. If you imagine um, training your like deep learning model with just the yellow data points, then you might get a Q of X distribution that looks like this yellow dash line. And then if you were to include these extra blue dots, um, like these extra training data points in your data set and then retrain the model, if you were to get this blue um, density estimate, then like their memorization score is the discrepancy between the yellow dash line and the blue dash line. So the argument is that say this blue point over here, they could say like that has high memorization because it's uh, affecting the assigned um, probability to that data point. Um, if it is included in the data or not, it's affecting the assigned probability quite a lot. So it's kind of looking for points that are somehow like salient in the problem of uh, estimating the data distribution. Like if they were to be removed, then somehow you have lost like an important part of the um, like data manifold so that you've reduced their probability, like their, ass their assigned model probability by quite a lot. So I'd say this point would have high memorization, but this point, because it is somehow close to uh, data points that are like already in the data set, then it's not really covering this new region of space very much. So it has like a low memorization score. And then they're like contrasting this with this idea of like overfitting, which might be what we were thinking about before, where you just have kind of like very peaked um, assigned probability on just the data point so that when you were to generate new samples, you would basically be copying or memorizing the data. Um, so they're like proposed way to estimate this is just like leaving one out, like a leave one out estimator. So um, if you want to look at the probability or like the memorization score of data point I with respect to some algorithm A and some data set D, you look at the assigned probability to data point I with an algorithm trained on the entire data set and look at the log probability and then compare that to the assigned probability of that data point XI with that algorithm A, but trained on a data set that does not include that data point. Um, and then if the discrepancy is high, then you can assume that, or like the idea is that this data point somehow covers some interesting part of space that um, if you were to leave it out, it wouldn't, um, uh, like it would affect the assigned probability in that region quite well, quite a lot. So like looking at CIFAR 10, and data points that have like low memorization and high memorization. Um, you'd, you'd expect that ones with high memorization would be somehow like atypical in some sense. So they're somehow away from the data manifold or like they're in some region where they are like far away in some sense from other training data points. Um, and indeed you do get some strange examples like a dog on a completely green background or like this red plane, which I guess we would intuitively see them as uh, atypical. But then you also have like very typical examples like this standard looking plane or, or this one, which to us seem very, they seem very standard, but when you were to leave them out, they have a very like different um, like assigned probability, which is, um, I guess a little unintuitive. <coughs> like <clears throat> it, it, it's implying that what points are useful and what points are not useful is not entirely intuitive. And there's some metric or uh, some kind of distance that we don't really understand that um, is um, kind of assigning um, like closeness in uh, like with regards to what the model understands. Um, Again, this is like another graph that they have to kind of drive home that point. Um, so it's like, you might think that points with 
this high memorization score um, might be kind of more easy to copy than, or like more likely to be copied by the model than points with low memorization score. Um, because if it's kind of in this atypical region, perhaps it has this greater assigned probability, so maybe it's going to be like more likely to be memorized. Um, and this plot is kind of dispelling that a little bit, where they have this nearest neighbor metric, which they define as a ratio of the minimum distance between the training data point and a point in the validation set. So that's like the numerator to the minimum distance between the training point and samples that have been generated. So a row value greater than one implies memorization is occurring because um, generated samples are closer to the training point than other genuine samples in the validation set. But like what they find is that there isn't really a correlation between memorization score and this um, nearest neighbor metric. So again, it's highlighting that it's quite difficult to assign like a meaningful closeness metric because here the distance they're using is just like L2. Um, including distance um, is kind of highlighting that it's not um, it's quite difficult to like have a meaningful closeness metric in in high dimension um, yeah so I guess some like conclusions or some like thoughts on, on these results it seems that SGD might have something to do with um, single mode generalization smoothness might also play a role somehow. Um, and the generative models can definitely memorize things, but it's not always intuitive what's going to be memorized and, and why. Um, so yeah, I think this presentation was like a lot of um, a lot of things that I think are quite unintuitive, but I don't think we really understand why um, any of this is happening. And I couldn't really find any good like papers that are, um, have like decent explanations for this. So. Yeah, that's my presentation. <laughs> and both of us think, uh, yeah, it's real that big way. It's very <laughs> fine. I mean, the fact that, for example, when you show memorization, they have good score, you know, in terms of like, you know, probability, this is be very important for like training, but when it comes to, I mean, to generation, it's not they're more memorized than other examples, it's very strange. Mm. Yeah, super strong. But I agree. Why are you able to kind of generate things which are like really something good? Yeah, so I, they are nowhere in the data set. It's kind of very right away. Yeah, I, I don't know, like because I've never seen such good like C part ten stuff as with like diffusion models, and I just wonder if like somehow does it have some extra bias or something that is allowing it to make. I, I think it's very curious why. I mean, we don't really understand why it works in the first place, so we can't really understand why anything else would be better. But it does seem that some things can generalize on low amounts of data quite well, which is so yeah. strange. Yeah, um, yeah, on the, uh, the uh, like, you know, mini max white or non city information that tells you uh, it shouldn't work. It, uh, that's the point, it does something with it bias. Yeah. But uh, yeah, this is a big point. But it'd be nice to be able to shed some kind of statistical <laughs> understanding to it at some stage. But yeah. it's really even very unclear to formalize to uh, as a format. Yeah, because it's like a lot of these things are out of the data distribution. Like yeah. it's the whole the, the GAM paper is called like on the anomalous generalization because technically having you know seven squares when you only have need six is like wrong. And it's like it's just out of the data distribution, but how do you how do you formalize it? Okay, it's out of the data distribution, but it's actually out in a way that is useful to us. And it's like mm -hmm. um, it's very hard to to, to formalize that. Yeah, when you look at the on glide the stuff you show from open air, it's like Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, because it's like, yeah, I just don't understand how it can it can go out of the data distribution and not just be noise like in such a high dimensional space how is it i don't know 
how is it going out of the distribution in such like a reasonable way? I think it's, it's interesting. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> then, mm -hmm. Any other question, Jojo? So, I just wonder if you can ask a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm asking questions. Do you have any ideas? Yeah, it's a point. Should we have lunch in 15 minutes or something like that? Yeah. Shall we go maybe here? There's more space.